Hello and welcome to the latest Daily Record live stream. I'm Paul Hutchin, the Daily Record's political editor. I'm joined by two esteemed colleagues, uh, Westminster editors Torco Crichton uh, and Peter Davidson, who's the uh, paper's live politics uh, editor. Um, we're just going to be chewing over the, the main events of this week that we've been writing about in the paper. Um, I'm broadcasting from uh, the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh and uh, quite close to the Parliament we have overflowing bins, uh, which probably brings me to the, the top issue in Scottish politics this week, which is the, the national bin strike, which started in Edinburgh and is now spread to about uh, 14 different council areas. Um, technically, it's a dispute between councils and uh, trade unions, but given that councils depend on their funding from the government, the government has now intervened. Um, Torkel, although you're based at Westminster, what's your take on this uh, damaging row? Well, I might not be in Edinburgh, but everyone across the UK has seen the visuals coming from Edinburgh in the last couple of weeks because, of course, national and international focus comes onto the city, the capital, during the Edinburgh Festival. And people haven't seen players, they've seen bins uh, overflowing, uh, people walking to festival venues past uh, cartons of, 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 of rubbish. Uh, and so as a visual protest, getting the bin men out in Edinburgh during the Edinburgh Festival was a great opening move by the trade unions. It's really put pressure on the councils and on the Scottish Government to, to try and sort this out. So we've seen, uh, as you revealed yourself this morning, Paul, there's going to be another round of talks today, th three-sided talks involving John Swinney, the, the Deputy uh, First Minister who's standing in for Finance Secretary Kate Forbes just now well, while she's in return to leave. COSLA, the Council's body, is going to be in there and the trade unions are going to be in there as well. Now, uh, trade unions previously rejected a 3% offer from, from COSLA. The Scottish Government put £142 million pounds of cash on the table to enable the Councils to pay, they said, 5% to the Council staff. Costler have just turned around and said, we don't have um, the matching amount of money, the same amount you to, to put in to, to bring us up to anywhere near that pay offer. Uh, so that was rejected by, uh, by, the, by the trade unions. A 5% offer is, is now on the table or, or, or being put on the table, but that's still not good enough for the trade unions. They, look, they say, look at England, look at the situation in England where council workers there have struck a deal with English local councils for a, a near two thousand pounds, one nine five zero flat rate increase for everyone. Now, for people at the lower end of the scale, people who are paid, you know, perhaps twenty, twenty one, twenty two thousand, that's a big increase. It could be a ten percent increase, which would just about meet inflation now. And for people who earn a bit more, obviously proportionally a bit less. So that one nine five zero, that ten percent rise, is what uh, the the trade unions in Scotland are looking at, and they're looking at that. Plus, they want a bit more than that. So there's talks this afternoon. Uh, Swinney talked to uh, the trade unions yesterday. All three sides are in today. So we might move swiftly to resolution because if it doesn't happen, the bins are going to be overflowing all over Scotland, not just in Edinburgh. Peter, let's look at the role of the Scottish Government in this. They brought an, an extra 140 million to the table in a bid to resolve the dispute. Um, that resulted in COSLA increasing the offer to about 5%. That wasn't good enough. Um, John Swinney met the unions in Cosley yesterday. There's another meeting planned for this afternoon in St Andrew's House. Do you sense that the Scottish Government are getting increasingly worried um, that they might be blamed for this? Yeah, well, if you kind of were on uh, Twitter over kind of Monday and over the weekend, there was the blame was getting pinged about everywhere. Labour, who, who run... Uh, Council in Edinburgh were getting blamed, and then Labour were blaming the government for not putting up the money. Um, and then the SNP were kind of going, well, no, it's Labour's to blame, and then I'm sure somebody blamed Westminster at some point as well. So it's everyone was getting the blame. Um, and um, I think it was Angus Robertson uh, blamed the council, which got a lot of uh, blamed Labour for, because they are the in power in, in, in the council. Um, but what's going to be interesting to see is, is when the bins start to pile up in Glasgow and Dundee, which are run by the SNP, who's, who's the SNP going to blame 
then. So uh, <laughs> there's this kind of uh, big merry-go-round of who's to blame, but no, nobody's actually. I mean, at the start of the week, not, nothing was really happening to get the problem fixed. And it's, I think uh, John Swinney is really kind of, uh, after being asked by the unions to kind of get involved in the discussions, he, he really has kind of uh, knocked heads together, it seems, and it looks like they're going to maybe find a deal. But as Torco was saying, um, I think in, until they get to maybe close to or, or beyond that £2,000 um, kind of number, then I think it could be we could be here for quite a while, and more strikes to come as, as the, the unions have, have kind of threatened as well. Torco, one of the things that, that interests me is that if you look at Compare it to south of the border, where we have a Tory government, you get quite a lot of union bashing. I'm thinking of Grant Shapps' rhetoric and blaming union bosses and union chiefs. But we don't really, or we haven't really had that up here, have we, in Scotland, in terms of the bin strike? And the focus has very much been on COSLA, it's been on the Scottish government. Do you think the temperature is slightly different in Scotland when it comes to industrial disputes? Well, we don't have a Conservative government in Scotland trying to strip trade unions of, of the right to strike for a start. And to be fair to Sharp, at the beginning of, say, the, the RMT strike, he tried to put network rail at buffer, the same as COSLA is a buffer between the government and the strikers. Uh, the, the, the Tory government England tried to put network rail uh, as a buffer in between themselves and the strikers. That, that simply has disintegrated now and it, it's a pretty hostile environment when it comes to the rail strikes. Um, the same thing could have happened, there's a different dynamic in Scotland with with, with, with a kind of uh, left of centre government, left of centre trade union movement uh, and councils which are kind of Labour or SNP uh, anyway. So there's a different dynamic there but there's also, you know, this figure is coming in, John Sweeney. John Sweeney's got a bit of a reputation as a fixer. Remember, he's the guy who got money out of the UK Treasury when it came to a new settlement uh, for Scotland after the Smith Commission, uh, after Scotland could receive tax raising powers, he managed to, to extract a great deal by sitting down, talking it through. So he's, he's a bit of a fixer, uh, and he's got to fix this, but he's in, the government are on the horns of a dilemma here. They, they can't, sure, let's give £2,000 to, 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 to every striking bin worker, and that'll, that'll clean up the streets. But in two weeks' time, nursery workers are going to walk out and strike, leaving nurseries and some schools in Scotland facing closure for a short time. That's going to inconvenience parents. Uh, and if you sort that one out, then <coughs> nurse, Scottish nurses have said they're not happy with their 5%, 5% that's that's on the table. And teachers are unhappy as well. So the whole public sector there, like everyone else, is facing huge inflationary rises uh, and cost of living price rises over the next, week, next couple of months. So the thing is, if you plug one leak, if you, if you, if you stop one dispute, uh, with money, you're then in danger of triggering a whole number of other disputes on the same line. So he's got to tread a fine line, Sony, between sorting this, offering this, but uh, showing some kind of restraint as well. Peter, if you look at a couple of other unions like the RMT and ASLEF, and um, through their strike action, they can stop trains running, um, which is a lot of power. Do you sense that the unions have the upper hand in this dispute as well, in the sense that they can... Uh, you know, their strikes can result in overflowing bins. Uh, their strikes can stop schools from reopening because, of course, their members include janitors, cleaning staff. Um, do you sense that they have quite a lot of leverage here? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, you just need to look at some of the images in, in Edinburgh over the weekend. I, I was in Edinburgh on uh, Friday and Saturday, and um, even then, that was only after, what, uh, one day on they started last Thursday, so that they were they were still pretty bad then. Um, so yeah, and people will get um, increasingly the kind of the public health um, side of it, which um, Swinney warned about yesterday, um, will kind of worsen. And, and I think that's when um, people, Cosla uh, and the government, will go. You know, this really needs to be fixed. And the unions um, are going to stick to their guns. They um, Wendy Dunsmore from. Unite said that the situation could get worse. We're going to strike more. So yeah, they do have the, the upper hand here. And um, when it does in other um, cities like uh, Aberdeen, Dundee, Glasgow, when the bins start to overflow there, I mean, yeah, it, it is going to get a lot worse. And the, the government are really going to just have to um, stump up money to to uh, to resolve this issue. Uh, moving on to what is without doubt 
the the issue that is causing most anxiety to people across the United Kingdom, this prospect of exorbitant energy price rises. Uh, we're going to have the price cap being lifted and, and probably bills will, will rise to between three and a half to four thousand pounds a year. And the question is, what is the government going to do to stop people falling into abject poverty? Now, we had a, I think we splashed it this week, a story about one of the power bosses, Keith Anderson at Scottish Power, um, calling for a £100 billion policy whereby bills would effectively be frozen for a couple of years. Um, Torgo, what, what did you make of this? And you know, without sort of backing this exact proposal, do you think something of this magnitude will eventually have to be uh, picked up by the UK government? It's one of these issues where something has to be done, uh, quite clearly. Tomorrow's a big bang day. Tomorrow's the day off, Jim, the, the energy regulator announces the price cap for October. Uh, every three months, uh, the price cap goes up. So that's expected to go up from something like an average of £1,500 uh, a year for the average house now, up to 3500 or more, perhaps an 80% rise in your October bill. It'll go up again in January to oh, nearly 5,000 and possibly by April, 6,000. It can't be done. People will be in desperation and destitution, uh, as the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon describes, and every charity uh, and organisation, uh, working, work, poverty organisation working in Scotland has warned that as well. So no one's promised a solution yet. Labour came up with a £29 billion plan to freeze uh, the prices at October levels through the winter. Uh, that would cost a lot of money. If they extended that through the year, it would cost more than, than furlough cost during the pandemic. But the power bosses themselves, who are the people delivering the power, who are also going to see their customers defaulting on payments. Let's admit this, let's, let, let's face up this, people won't be able to afford to pay their bills. They've come up with a better scheme, a bigger scheme. They say, we see your 29 billion and we raise you 100 billion. Uh, Keith Anderson, the chairman of Scottish Power, has come up with this plan to... to to bank, to bank the rise, just put it in a pot, 100 billion, 200 billion over two years actually, uh, and keep bills at their present level. And to decide later on how that 200 billion should be paid off. Should be paid off in higher individual taxes? Should be paid off with a surcharge on, uh, on people's future bills over the next 10, 15, 20 years perhaps? Or perhaps, who knows, paid off with a big, big windfall on the oil and gas companies that are making quite a big profit out of uh, wholesale prices just now. Two good things about the Anderson plan, if we can call it that. It, a, it freezes bills now. That's good. It'll take the fear out of people because people are very worried about going into the winter and facing these bills. And B, it kind of parks the problem. It allows time to sort out how to pay this off because yeah. it has to be paid off somehow. Uh, so an incoming prime minister, I think it's going to be Liz Truss, uh, if she adopted this plan, and Keith Anderson gave this plan to a roundtable Nicola Sturgeon convened in Edinburgh this week, he'd also spoken to Quasi Quarting, the UK uh, Energy and Business Minister uh, in Westminster earlier. The plan is in Whitehall. It's one of the options that could be presented to an incoming Prime Minister, what, a week, a week Monday, uh, and then it'll have to be enacted pretty quickly, because tomorrow people will know how much they're going to be paying in October, and they're going to get a flight. Peter, these rises, if they were to go ahead, will affect every single daily record user. So every time you know you put on the heating, every time you use the shower, use the kettle, washing machine, it's going to have a major impact on people's finances. Um, and yet you look at Liz Truss, and she's talking about cutting national insurance, which puts pennies back in the pockets of um Scots and people across the UK. She's talking about scrapping the green levy, which I think is about 150 quid a year. Do you think that you know that there'll be a danger for Liz Truss that she's seen as just completely out of step with what seems to be an emerging consensus amongst power giants and, and the Labour Party that, that that something quite big and drastic needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the politicians who are on astronomical wages, they just don't understand what people are going to be in, the situation that people are going to be in. It's, um, I mean, there's 
fuel poverty is um, kind of going to skyrocket, and, and actual poverty is, is going to is just going to be uh, it's going to rocket as well. But yeah, you're right that we've spoken about this on on this stream before, and um, that we know that the civil service is actually um, coming up with a number of plans uh, to present to the next prime minister when, when they come in. Um, so it'll be interesting to see because, like you say, what she is proposing is it's nothing. It's it's 150 pounds. That's when your um, fuel bill is going to go up by 80 percent. It's it is absolutely nothing. So it was also interesting that that um, Nadim Zahawi was asked his reaction on uh, the proposals by uh, Keith Anderson. He, kind of, he said that nothing was off, was off the table. So it's mm. I think he he's clearly knows what's going on in the civil service. Uh, Kind of the treasury at the moment so um yeah i think they're they're, they're not going to copy someone else's proposal and um, like the windfall tax they went a bit further than uh, labor's one uh, when when sunak was the the chancellor so yeah they'll, they'll be their own plan um and we just we'll need to wait and see and and then uh, what it is and, and how drastic it is because i think it does need to be a big plan that really helps people get through uh, the winter months because I mean we're only at in August now and people are already struggling so it's it is going to get a lot worse by the time we get to January when we've got that next uh, cap that comes in. And the I, last I thing that I want yeah. to discuss on this uh, uh, live stream is uh, Nicola Sturgeon's appearance at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I mean she's she had a few appearances but the the one I went to was an interview with the sports journalist. Graham Spears. It was quite a, a lively interview. It lasted for about an hour. Uh, certainly from a journalistic perspective, there are quite a few news lines in it. Um, one of them related to the abuse by pro-independence activists of the BBC journalist James Cook, who I think was called a scumbag rat and also a traitor by uh, these charming individuals. Um, and uh, during the interview, Nicola Sturgeon basically condemned what she described as a fringe element in the nationalist movement. Um, what, what did you make of her comments, Torko? Well, fair, fair enough. Uh, we've all suffered, just with James Cook, we've all suffered, but James Cook suffered and worse over the years uh, as a certain element of either side, but the nationalist side mainly, as we said, attacks the media for not representing the reality as, as it sees it. Now, Sturgeon, Distance ourselves, distance ourselves from these attacks at the time, shortly after the, the, the Cook video went, went viral. And she took the opportunity again when Graeme Spears, that charming man, uh, grilled her uh, at the festival. It wasn't the only appearance she made at the festival, she made quite a few appearances at the festival. Uh, fair enough, she's distances herself from them, uh, from these individuals, who I suspect are people who left mainstream SNP uh, activism long time ago. She, she may have no control over, over these people or their membership of any party or organisation that they wish to belong to. Uh, but I think she should have condemned this kind of behaviour a, a long, long time ago. This kind of behaviour was going on in 2014 when people marched on BBC Scotland's headquarters at Pacific Key and demanded mm. the head of Nick Robinson, uh, the then uh, political editor of the BBC. Uh, and if Sturgeon had, had pushed back against that then, uh, then I don't know. We would, we, would the debate have been any more civic? I, 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 I don't know. His, you know. We can't we can't replay history like that. But one thing's for sure is that Sturgeon hasn't really pushed back against fundamentalist nationalism quite hard enough. I think you know, and the fact that she's now kind of dancing to the tune of a twenty twenty three independence referendum, which I think she suspects is not achievable uh, herself. Uh, shows that she hasn't pushed back hard enough. I mean, I keep saying this, the SNP quite successfully became the Labour Party uh, in Scotland, quite successfully became left of centre and adopted uh, their values and their voters. But what Nicola Sturgeon has failed to do is become Tony Blair. Tony Blair became made Labour electable by almost going to war with his own party, taking a stance against his own party to prove to undecided voters, people who hadn't made up their mind up to trust Labour, uh, that they could while he was in charge of it, while he contained the wilder elements of the left. Now, Nicola Sturgeon hasn't done the same thing in trying to contain the wilder elements of nationalism, a large part of, will, of whom will have, will have left the SNP by now and gone to 
that all of our, our other committees perhaps. But if you've chosen to, to tackle our own party a little bit and stand in the centre ground a bit more of where, where Scotland is constitutionally and politically, she might have, have more success, but that remains to be seen. Peter, something else she said, inevitably in interviews now, she's always asked about uh, how long she's got left in office because she is now Scotland's longest serving First Minister. And I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but she effectively said that she's not going to be the sort of politician who clings to office when she knows that her time is up, something like that. Um, there seems to be a feeling that you know she wants to see the, the second indirect process through from a legal perspective and also the general election. But do you think it's interesting that there is so much discussion about uh, when she's going to stand down? Yeah, I mean, well, she, she kind of has to kind of show that she, she's not going to be there forever. Because, I mean, when it, let's just say the referendum does go ahead uh, next year and and uh, she does, she loses it, she's going to have to, she will show, put her step down um, uh, like uh, Alex Salmon did. Um, so she has to show that, yeah, I've been thinking about this for a while. It's not just like a um, kind of a, a snap decision I've made here. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, there's been chat about this for a while. That the fact that she has been, she is now um, Scotland's longest serving first minister. But um, yeah, I mean, she's just to set herself, set herself up for for after politics, she's still relatively young when you think about it. Um, so yeah, she needs to um, think of her future really. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, people will always go, "Who's next?" Then you know, and it it just kind of gets people speaking and. Uh, maybe takes us off some of the issues that really need to be addressed. <laughs> Just to go back to a point that you mentioned about um, Nicola Sturgeon maybe not standing up at an earlier stage to um, more extreme elements of her own movement. Um, something else she said, which was interesting, is that she considers herself to be Scottish and British. Do you, uh, just interested to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that was maybe an attempt to sort of reach out to people who've got a, a dual identity, maybe try to broaden the base a little bit? For, for sure it was, but but once again, slightly late. You remember, you, know, you and I have a pedigree who, uh, where we can remember Andrew Wilson mm. uh, saying that he might be quite proud to fly a Union Jack on occasion and was slammed by the SNP for that. In fact, you know, was ranked so low in the selection process that he, that he lost his his seat as, a, as an MSP. Uh, now what, what Sturgeon did in, in saying that she uh, accepted, identified and felt uh, British sometimes, Scottish sometimes, at other times, you know, that she has a layered identity. We all have a, a layered identity because we live in the British Isles, as she said herself, but we'll always retain this kind of sense of Britishness, even if Scotland becomes an independent country. Now, you sense Sturgeon there moving once again into where hmm, the mainstream, where most Scots are, you know? I feel Hebridean, I feel Scottish, I feel British, I feel European. People have different different layers of identity. And she's maybe moving into that kind. But once again, she should have done this a lot earlier. And you know, of course she's crossed that Rubicon now, every political leader does, you know, where people start questioning their shelf life and, and what they'll do next and how long they'll be around for. Uh, it may be not up to Nicola Sturgeon to to find that sweet spot of identity where people feel British and Scottish enough to, to choose independence over remaining in the UK, and that might be left to the next uh, nationalist leader who, who tries to take the SNP and Scotland on that path. Well, that's great. Thanks, Torkel. Thanks, Peter. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, in next week's live stream, I think that we'll be looking at uh, the, the Tory leadership contest, which seems to have gone on for about 150 years. Uh, next week it will be in its, its last lap and hopefully we'll be nearing towards a conclusion uh, and we'll probably look back on Boris Johnson's um, interesting time in Downing Street as well. So um, if you've enjoyed this live stream, please follow us on Twitter. We've got our own uh, Twitter uh, web page, which is at record underscore politics. We've also got a politics group on our Facebook site as well, um, where you can keep abreast of all of our content. So thanks for joining us again and hope to see you soon.